and also sits on their corporate governance subcommittee and the listing slash selection committee of the soon to be launched Jamaica Social Stock Exchange. Indiana serves on many boards. She's as a board member of the University of Guyana Press and the Diaspora Engagement Center also in Guyana. She has held appointments at the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship in Oxford, the University of Waterloo Center for International Governance Innovation in Canada, as well as the Shridath Ram Ramphal Center in Barbados. Her research publications and consultancies span the area of diaspora, entrepreneurship, international business, ICTs, disaster risk management, and public policy. Her research and publications feature in international conferences, journals, and books, including her co-edited book on public administration and policy in the Caribbean. Dr. Minta Coy, who is a PhD from the London School of Economics. Ladies and gentlemen, help me make welcome Dr. Indiana D. Minta Coy. That's appropriate. Dr. Coy will continue by introducing our panelists for this session. Thank you very much and good morning to everyone. Oftentimes I hear that bio and I wonder who they're speaking about because it doesn't feel like me. Um, this morning we have a very esteemed panel and we are going to be starting with, we've reorganized the order ever so slightly. So we will begin with uh, Senator Dr. Floyd Morris. And I'll give the bios all at once to save on a little time. Uh, first, before I begin, it's a privilege to be here at this uh, very auspicious event. Well-meaning, well-intent, um, and looking forward to great outcomes as well. So firstly, Senator Floyd Morris is a distinguished Jamaican and truly epitomizes what this conference and its focus is about. Having developed glaucoma at the age of 14, and going on to become blind at the age of 20, and failing all his final exams due to his illness, he then made the decision to turn his life around and sought rehabilitation at the Jamaica School for Blind. Fast forward to 2018, and he has now a doctorate from the University of the West Indies, and he's an author. He was called to, the nas to national duties sorry, in 1998 when he became the first blind person to be appointed to the Senate of Jamaica and later served as a Minister of State, as President of the Senate, again the first blind person to do so, and since 2016 he served as Opposition Senator. He is a director for the UE Center for Disability Studies and is the CARICOM Special Rapporteur on Disability for the Caribbean. He's a recipient of many awards, including the Prime Minister's Lifetime Award for Excellence in Disability Reform. He's a devout Christian, and importantly, along with all those accolades, in 2011, he was crowned Domino Champion for his home church, the Andrews Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our second speaker, will be Roberta Cantarella, sorry. Professor Cantarella studied at the State University of the West of Paraná, where she focused on language, literature, and the teaching and history of Portuguese. She later completed her PhD studies in literature at the Federal University of Santa Carina, which focused on critical feminist research and gender studies. She's a lecturer at the Federal Institute of Brasilia. Her areas of specialty include Portuguese as a second language for the deaf. Our third speaker from Cuba, Ms. Odalis Cantelaria de la Nuez Licea. I hope I got that, excellent. Ms. Licea is from Cuba, as I mentioned before. She's a graduate from the Polytechnic Superior Institute, Eduardo Garcia Delegado, in 1986 in electronic computer machines, and she completed her bachelor's in education with a specialty in computer science. 
Odalis also has a master's in new technologies for education. Odalis is currently an instructor at the Central Palace of Computing and Electronics, where she also delivers workshops for special groups such as seniors and people with disabilities. And our final speaker, but in no means least, will be Ms. Alexa Torres. Alexa graduated from the University of Costa Rica with a focus on Spanish and literature and Spanish philology. She is a digital accessibility consultant at the Computer Center of the University of Costa Rica and in private companies such as Plura. She's a trainer in the field of inclusion of people with disabilities, inclusive communication, and accessible social networks. So join with me, ladies and gentlemen, just to give a warm welcome to our panel. And I will now step aside, and Senator Morris will begin the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Minta Coy for your kind introduction and a pleasant good morning to my distinguished panelists, uh, colleagues, and to all the members of uh, the uh, conference. And to first and foremost say that I am very disappointed that I'm not able to be physically there because I came in last night from uh, Turks and Caicos Island on official business and uh, uh, I have a Senate meeting at 10 o'clock this morning, so I am unavoidably absent. But I am very much supportive of the cause of the conference, um, and I hope that it will achieve its objectives. Now, this morning, uh, for my presentation, uh, been asked to look at the whole issue of digital inclusion and the efforts to include persons with disabilities in this whole process in terms of education and skills training. As indicated, I am head of the UWI Center for the Dis Disability Studies. Education and advocacy for persons with disabilities in Jamaica and the broader Caribbean. In as far established a policy. is because the institution was accepting more and more students with disabilities. And so there was the need for a policy to guide disabilities. Now, upon assuming the role as director for the Center for Disability Studies, I've been doing some research at the tertiary level and what ter at the tertiary level of our institution education system there there is a willingness to accept and include persons with disabilities at that level and, and making efforts to accommodate persons with disabilities. But what we find is that the number of students at that level is very limited. In further checks, we realize that at the lower level of the education system, there are serious challenges. There are serious challenges in terms of access, there are serious challenges in terms of inclusion, involves, among other things, a, a quantitative study a few years ago to assess the situation of 
inclusion and access of persons with disabilities in the education system. And few of those educational institutions have persons with disabilities. Wondering where you where you last heard me. You were talking about a study that was done to that question. Okay. Okay. So I mentioned the study. The study on in a that would have dependently oh. in the Okay, Floyd, um, we're going to break uh, because we're having a serious problem hearing. What we'll do in the meantime is ask Roberta to begin her presentation and just give us a few minutes, Floyd. We'll try to set this all right. So I'll invite yes. Roberta to begin. Our apologies for that audience. Good morning. I'm waiting for my PowerPoint. Okay, thanks. Good morning. I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to speak about some of inclusion initiatives taking place in Brazil. The network of Federal Institute was created in 2008, when the Brazilian government put together several technical schools and centers of technical education and agrotechnical schools to create the Federal Institute of Education, Science and Technology. Okay, I need to show something for you. Can you put for me to second uh, slide, please? Okay. Um, uh, the network of Federal uh, Institute before 2008, can you see in, on the slide, please? But after 2008, uh, they are now 644 units of the network spread all over the country and 561 cities. Brazil more, uh, has more than 5,500 cities. So. The network of Federal Institute is composed of 30 different institutes and more 
three and other kinds of education institutions. Sorry, institutions. The network is now is important extra uh, structure for Brazilian students to have uh, effective access to uh, uh, scientific, um, sorry, uh, um, <laughs> technology uh, achievement. The technical education was established in Brazil only after uh, the, um, the, the, um, the military dictatorship. So, uh, last four years. Before that, the focus was the education for agriculture, and it was a huge leap on the culture's priorities. In recent years, the network is seeking to diversify programs, offering qualification class, integrated high school, advanced technology, higher education, and graduate degrees education. So covering the whole national territory, the network of federal institutes provide an important service qualifying professional of the many uh, the many uh, sectors for, of the Brazilian economy, conducting research in developing new processes, products and services in collaboration with the productive sector. Today, there are more than 1 million students and about 70,000 professors and technicians uh, developing more than 10,000 applies research and with the participation of, of the community, about 6,000 outreach and inclusion projects. Next December, the network of Federal Institute will celebrate 10 years of its creation. Now, remember, the network of Federal Institute is composed of 41 different institutions. The Federal Institute of Brasilia, IFB, is located in the capital of Brazil, with regional, uh, 10 regional campi. I work at the Ceilandia campus, the most recent of them. Its activities begun in July 2012, offering basic computer classes for the older persons. As you see, the inclusion programs are in our camp's DNA. Each campus has the own education profile based on the economy and social needs of the region at its place. In Ceilandia campus, the focus is on electronics. Today, we offer more than different programs, such as high school, combined with technical education, electronic technicians, workplace safety and Spanish language, biomedicine, and Portuguese as a second language for deaf people, and basic Brazilian sign language, Libras. There are about 1,000 regular students in Ceilândia. In our inclusion program, we still offer to the local older person the basic computer classes, adding finest classes and basic Spanish for the older persons. We have managed to bring quality education to over 700 senior students in those outreach classes so far. We have already published one paper telling our stories, Digital Inclusion and Story with a Flavor, and two editions of Talent Show. The inclusion program also provides the scholarship holders of Campus Ceilandia in, in spirits in the universe beyond the classroom with pedagogical process through the articulation between teaching, research, and community outreaching. 
is extremely interesting apply and eager learn all this. Many students bring many stories of overcoming and during the classes have the opportunity to open your minds and make new friendships. The use of computer science has always shown to be an ally to improve the quality of life of some students who start the classes with problems with, of depress, uh, de depression. There were cases of students who finished their classes completely free of medication. No, sorry. Now I knew show some videos some, so, with some of our senior student, student, students. É aqui no IFB onde eu me recomponho, posso chegar triste, sair daqui feliz da vida, sorrindo, parecendo que não tenho nenhum problema, deixar para trás. E graças a Deus, foi, foi assim, um, um ponto muito positivo aqui para mim, porque aquilo que eu não sabia fazer, hoje pelo menos eu não estou dependendo de neto, não estou dependendo da amiga e estou fazendo sozinha. Então, é, o IFB, eu costumo dizer, é a minha segunda casa. Bem, meu nome é Marisa. Eu sou Maria Helena, tenho 68 anos, faço o curso aqui desde, de mil, desde 2013, já passei por várias etapas, e fiz o primeiro, o primeiro que foi de formática, o primeiro básico, agora estou no nível 2. Isso para mim foi muito importante porque eu não sabia nem sequer ligar um computador. E agora já tem, faço muitas coisas, já sei entrar no Facebook, já sei entrar no e-mail, já sei mandar algumas coisas, já que a gente faz no, no trabalho de informática. E para mim isso foi muito importante do IFB ter, ter aberto essas oportunidades, a terceira idade. Porque enquanto a gente estamos aqui, não ficamos em casa, lá, à toa, sem fazer nada. Então, botar o cérebro para funcionar. Isso é muito importante. Bom dia. Meu nome é Maurina Alves dos Santos. Tenho 67 anos. É, eu só tenho a agradecer os professor, o professor Jocênia, é, Juliana e todos do campus, porque foi, me ajudou bastante, eu não sabia usar nem o celular digital. Agora eu sei fazer o que eu quero fazer no computador, eu sei. Sei ligar, sei enviar mensagens, sei apagar o que eu não posso, que eu não quero deixar. Então. Me ajudou muito na recuperação, que eu tinha uma depressão muito forte. Eu não tinha força nem para me arrumar, nem para tomar banho. E graças a Deus, com a ajuda de todos, eu me recuperei. Agora eu considero outra pessoa, certo? E só isso. Also, the Ceilandia Campus has a number of special partners, such as ITU. Three e, weeks ago, we promoted a tic tac event of at the campus, focus in insert uh, of girls in technological file field. This tic tac event had the purpose to show the young women should pursue technological careers. In current, sorry, 
join the universe becomes international concern, so creation, creating more opportunity to, for young women in the workplace. To speak about this experience, I would like to invite Ana Veneroso, coordinator of the Tic Tac event, to talk about it and the partnership between ITU and the Ceilandia campus. Thank you very much, Roberto. I think we're, we now have um, Floyd Morris. Dr. Morris is back with us. Um, we've made some accommodation to allow him to do his presentation. And we'll go back to uh, the panel afterwards. So, Senator Morris, I hear you're back with us. Yes, yes, I'm excellent, here. Excellent, excellent. We'll go back with you now. OK. Sir. OK. All right, thank you very much, and sorry about that. Sorry that you won't see my handsome face. <laughs> All right. About the research that we had conducted, problems at the primary and the, the secondary level in terms of access to technology. So being the recent reaction research center that we are at the University of the West Indies, we decided that we were going to put together some projects to execute an initiative that would see modern technologies being made available to persons with disabilities who are pursuing education So we did two things. One, we contacted the e-learning project uh, in Jamaica, which is one of the excellent initiatives coming out of the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, and the Ministry of Science, Energy, Technology. And through that uh, initiative, we were able to secure funding to purchase the most modern So we, we, we got funding from the e-learning project to equip these six special education institutions with the latest of technology that would allow these children to um, be able to interact with the computer. As simultaneously, we recognized that there were some challenges for deaf persons in terms of accessing information and preparing for a certain CXE or Caribbean Certificate Examination Council exams. And while the information, they had their challenges. So what we did through the e-learning initiative was to convert those presentations into site be able to access that information and we have on so okay. that students who are deaf can okay it's been I, a I, Senator, we are having a really hard time following. Um, the, the connection is not good at all. 
So what I'm mm -hmm. going to suggest is that we move on to our third speaker, Odalis. I'm keeping my eyes very fixed on the time that we have. So we are going to move on to Odalis. Um, we are going to try one more time to come back to you. I don't know if it will be better next time, but we'll go with Odalis and then with Alexa, and then we'll try and connect back with you, Senator. Okay. Thank you so much. So Odalis, thank you. Buenos días. Eh, primeramente, gracias por invitarnos a América Accesible. Eh, gracias a la doctora por la presentación y a Jamaica por la hospitalidad que nos ha brindado y a, así como a todos los que organizaron América Accesible. Voy a comenzar mi presentación. Accessible Americas. I'm going to start my presentation with a video. If you could kindly put it up. Could we have the sound, please? Um, computer sciences helps to grow the community, even in difficult conditions. We we like to give knowledge and computers knowledge to the community. Near the municipality in this part of the country, we have Hub and Club that gives many services to this area, including assistance to um, households that are in remote areas in the in Guantanamo, in the Guantanamo Bay area. Well, I've been working with Hoven Club for the last 15 years, and what Hoven Club has given me is that I work with computers, and I'm one of these people who can teach computer sciences to the rest of the community. And she is very well received when she goes to these house households. I have done quite a few courses in Hoven Club. And I have also had good working relations with the other members in the factory where I work. Well, the members of my family have also benefited from this. And we have a knowledge of computer sciences. There are also many activities, not only in things for work, but there are other things for entertainment. It is a great pride for me to go to these households because it is a question that needs dedication. And we are all committed to this work. This is a commitment that we have. We have an objective to comply because revolution has called upon us to give computer sciences to the rest of the community. Sometimes we cannot, um, we have to come by foot. Other times we go on horseback. So I'm very proud that Cuban families can learn about computers. We can have the elderly, we can have children, the disabled, everyone gets access to this. So we have nights, the computer nights, and we give technical information to all the households. And these are some of the services that the home and Claude of this area in Cuba provides. So in, the, in giving in computer science is the rest of the society. This is ESL Delgado um, so reporting for the radio services. Thank you. When I so, so this is just to show you how we give, provide services to the com communities that are very remote. And this video was uh, filmed in Guantanamo, one of the eastern provinces in Cuba. So now we're going to see some of the examples of the experience of capacity building and training has given. So the first example that I'll show you. So, well, you have it in Spanish. Could we have it in Spanish as well? It's over there.
Okay, so I'll continue. So we are going to have a link the associationships, the associations with which we work and that is we work with them on a daily basis. We have ANSI for the white blind, the ANSOX for people who are deaf, and ACLIM FIM for people with um, physical disabilities. Now, so we give attention to children with visual disability through our specialized course, Teeth Law Informatic. This is for children in the primary, second cycle, fifth and sixth grades where the children who participate in this course can interact with the computer through the tool that is called JAWS. And this is going to convert the content of the screen into sound so that the child can have access or navigate without having to see it. So now we're going to look at another example, which is a collection of games that is called I Am Unique and Special. And it's a collection of video games for children with mental retardation at the, at the primary level. And this can be used in design device with Android as operating system as a tool to complement uh, their free time work, the free time activities, and for which a collection was made um, and, composed of, and is composed of three games. So there's one that is called Mariposeando, going exploring like a, like a butterfly. One is called ex Caring for My Planet and Exploring My Planet. Now, this does not, a lot uh, remains to be done to help people with disabilities throughout the country. However, there are barriers that have been overcome. So this is an example of the multimedia activities that we carry out in all of the, our workshops with uh, persons with disabilities. Another example is an application that is for um, helping with the ca um, calculation and mathematics. That is people with dyscalculia, which is possibilities, dis difficulties with um, calculating with mathematics and and difficulty solving mathematical problems and operations, and it helps develop skills uh, from s speech therapy treatments at the primary and special education. So these uh, students will be able to develop skills based on special approaches to learning at the primary and other levels, as well as learning computers. And then there's another example here that is a website, Joy in the Club. And this is the use of technologies and the use of the web page for clients with disabilities. Uh, since information is accessed with topics of pleasure, with high quality content, uh, that facilitates learning and raising their self-esteem. So the project is um, projected towards applied with abilities to help them to use computers and to help them to use other resources. Multimedia, which is called Saber, eh, knowing how to, to grow old for elderly people. And there's a computer tool to be used in meetings at Jera Club that gathers together all of the issues and discusses the issues and concerns for elderly people. It helps them to develop themselves and their knowledge. And we have set up a multimedia system for these elderly people. This is a computer tool that can be used, as I said, in all of their meetings. They, it deals with all of the questions of concern to them, and it tries to entertain them. So one of the experiences that we have had, and it has been quite important, it's we have to have it a tool that can be used by the elderly that will be help them to fully realize their potential. And so they're going to also carry out activities. They, there are, this tool is also used in pediatric hospitals as well as in um, orphan, orphanages. 
And this is an example of the multimedia, a tool that is a content which refers to health. The talks about psychological questions, where people can just say exactly, express their feelings and tell what has happened to them in their lives and the realities that they're, they, they're facing. And there are games that are specifically focused towards elderly people. So another experience that we have had in the computing palace where I work is a mobile application to help children, young people, and adults with disabilities to communicate and be more independent. So they come to our center and we have specialized staff and who use this application and using their mobile phones, they can communicate using the device. So let us look and show that children, young girls having access to internet, internet access for girls. We have navigation courses, circles of interest. We have access to information. We have online projects for children for all, from all ages. And all of this work that we do is for the benefit of the community. And here we see a group of elderly people Most of these people are, are visually impaired or blind, and they are helped in this class. And the technology is used to help the people with disabilities or with limited capabilities. Other questions that we see is, is the program that educate, how to educate or how to bring up your child. It shows the family links so this, between the school and the family. We have uh, opportunities to learn ab about ICT in education. We give online courses that are appropriate for the child's age, age appropriate online courses in, in other words. and. We try to develop skills from an early age, and so we have schools in Cuba. The René Vilches School that is um, supports the work and upbringing of children. That is, so there is an interaction between the family and the schools. So another example is an example of the sort of work that we carry out in the work. We have technology to empower people with disabilities to develop communication with their friends and to share that, show them that they are not alone. This is an example of access to the ICT through online games. That is for people with disabilities. Another example that we have in Cuba, we have activities for people who feel alone. And so when we're with them, they feel as if they're supported, they feel happy, and they feel as if they are in a family. So thank you very much for your attention. Gracias a todos. Thank you so much, Odalis, and for, for sticking a, a little closer to the time. We are going to move on to Alexa, and um, I'm told that we've tried another bit of technology. We are here at the conference, it's about ICTs, right? So we've tried another bit of technology, which we'll get in Senator Morris after Alexa has spoken. Thank you, Alexa. Gracias. Buenos días. Eh, bueno, yo les voy a comentar un poquito acerca de los proyectos que se han desarrollado en la Universidad de Costa Rica. En cuanto a, te, a la inclusión digital y acceso a la información, la Universidad de Costa Rica fue fundada en 1940 y es una de las cinco universidades públicas de nuestro país. A partir de 1970, As la Universidad of de Costa Rica ha uh, so uh, policies for uh, uh, students with disabilities. So right now we have approximately 500 students uh, with disabilities who have registered for 20, second term of 2018. 
So it's uh, quite a large number of uh, persons with disabilities in our university, and therefore we have developed programs and initiatives which uh, focus uh, on services and access to information for these persons. So therefore we are making our programs accessible to everyone. We are talking about digitizing the information. We are producing programs uh, in, project, in formats which can be accessible to persons with disabilities. We this, this covers all the readings for the courses uh, so that our, these students can enjoy uh, the literature. And uh, we have a, a library course. Uh, all the books in the library, the books, the libraries are, are being made available and accessible to persons with disabilities. So we rely on technology for that. Uh, we have we provide computer screens. We have magnifiers for the texts, uh, and uh, we do several other. Uh, there are several other activities that we facilitate. So we're talking here about the accessible libraries. Uh, before we used the uh, pilot programs just, but thanks to uh, the consultations with the students, we were able, we decided to change it to another methodology for, for readers. So we then started to talk with the, the students told the librarians that they didn't like that methodology of JOS. They wanted other features. They wanted uh, to have a, a kind of uh, open access program. Uh, they preferred uh, videos. So, so the, the, this year, for example, we modified the programs. We got new computers with uh, in, in, in innovative methodologies. So you're talking here about accessible libraries and the informatics department. Uh, uh, set up in 2017 to provide access to information for all students. Uh, then Accessible Americas uh, 4, we have been working on this. Uh, now, one of the actions that we have taken at the cent Informatics Center is to carry out training and sensitization activities. We have undertaken training using uh, uh, projecting on screens. Uh, we have developed uh, web pages. Uh, and in this way, we have taught how these students how to use uh, the web pages. Uh, we have a Department of Human Resources. Uh, uh, that who pay special attention to, to these persons with disabilities, um, and because we know that uh, it is important that the students be able to to use uh, the, the the various uh, devices, so we realize subsequently that many times the students do not use uh, the screens, do not know how to use the screens, and therefore do not really benefit uh, from the full, uh, all the features of the courses. And uh, they, they, they tended to use just uh, the JOS and, uh, and, um, and therefore did not get the full benefit. Fits. Uh, so we organized workshops uh, for beginners uh, to teach them how to use uh, the new technology, uh, these innovative, uh, innovative uh, screens. Uh, and uh, we had practical sessions where they could uh, to use touch, touch screens, uh, uh, which was facilitated by Windows. Uh, and we also uh, told them how to navigate uh, the, the web and so on. So this is what we have been doing at the level of innovative um, methodologies for persons with disabilities. So we then offer uh, very practical courses uh, in using Instagram and, and uh, making several publications accessible. So also in the social media, we through this campaign of Accessible Americas, we have been encouraging more persons uh, 
to be using these techniques. And uh, in August, for example, we were managed to diversify quite a, ba quite a bit. In terms of uh, 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 thematic areas, we are constantly evaluating uh, 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 and these, uh, we have one person who was uh, w that person, a person, a disabled person. That person is me. I, I do a lot in trying to keep up with the standards uh, that are required. Uh, now, among the systems that we have evaluated, uh, there is one where, where whereby one can. Uh, Get uh, medical appointments uh, on on the on the web, and uh, we are able to also see our timetables or schedules on the web through the um, the university portal, and uh, we also have a web page for the university uh, staff. And everything is totally uh, in accessible formats. Uh, we here, for example, we have we in at UCR, we have also designed our own website, giving the full uh, all the locations on the campus, and therefore, and I'm responsible for that as well. Now, last year, two thousand. In the, at the cent informatics center, we did a comparative study of the text processors, and we uh, and 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 we were able to uh, we looked at the Microsoft Office, and we were able to see what we could modify in order to suit the needs of of, of our of blind students, for example. And we also have other tools for accessibility. So this is uh, the kind of things that we do at in our office. We have the informatics center at the university. We facilitate uh, students' visits. We we have the UCR really uh, tries to involve our students to get feedback from them, and the end user. Uh, in this case, the student with disability, they also need to speak of their needs, uh, and their committees have been set up uh, so for them to be able to have their voice, to, to have their say, and uh, we the, their in the initiatives that have been that come about due to the action of the student body, and of the among these initiatives. Uh, we have the unit, the unit for technological studies. Uh, in 2016, this was set up. We we had three st uh, st studies with disabilities, uh, and they participated and they assisted us in uh, providing these services for disabled students. Uh, this was uh, I, I really like this type of of work, and I think we really were able to do a lot. Uh, the, the the names of the students, uh, they have different uh, levels of of sight, uh, and they were able to to contribute quite a bit, uh, and they have been working uh, very closely with our projects. Also, we evaluate different uh, types of applications, uh, computers with text uh, with images. Uh, we look at converters for audio. We look at uh, screen texts uh, and rec voice recognition. These applications uh, all contribute to accessibility, uh, uh, and we are able uh, to modify screens, uh, magnify images, uh, change colors. Uh, and uh, we were able also to put out a publication for disabled uh, students uh, with enlarged text uh, so that uh, students would be better able to appreciate the content. Uh, so in terms of we also manipulated different uh, websites. Uh, and uh, if we had different persons responsible for each, uh, each web page. And they always were encouraged to make recommendations for improvement. So, in the 
Department uh, um, Socioeconomic Studies. Uh, we have an office for registering information. And uh, we have a financial admin office. Uh, and we have a virtual uh, classrooms. Uh, we have uh, um, library and documentation offices. Uh, and we have um, orientation uh, uh, classrooms. So this work, our, our work, has been very diverse, uh, and uh, all and we involve our students a lot in the work that we're doing. Uh, approval was given uh, by the university council, and uh, our intent is to guarantee access to all information and involving, being inclusive and involving students in our work. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work uh, where we have to provide a lot of information and, and what we, our, our uh, intent is not to leave students with uh, disabilities outside of the, of the mainstream of knowledge so that we have a universe, uh, student uh, uh, union or federation. They are very vocal and uh, they are you know, in, involved with all social media. They are not deprived of any facility. One of our challenges is to continue to empower our disabled student community. As I said earlier, we, uh, we encourage them to, to speak and we have facilitate their uh, input. We also have the challenge of including or bringing on board all the aspects of university administration and staff so that we can continue with this pioneering work, serve as an example, and uh, we try to do this in all areas. Uh, so finally, there's, uh, the, there's a, a particular screen that we use, and there's a particular phrase that we use, as an, as an informed society is a participatory society, and at our university, UCR, we feel that we must generate access by all to information, and, uh, and uh, our information must be socially active and socially participatory, and uh, 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 daily in our daily lives, we all need to at all times be able to participate in our societies, and these are the types of projects then that we focus on in my unit and at the UCI. And thank you very much for having listened to me. Thank you very much, Alexa. So we will make one final attempt. Um, Senator Morris is back with us at this stage. Senator Morris, uh, you have two to five minutes maximum just to summarize your presentation thank you all right um i trust and hope that uh they could have heard some of what i've said and i'd reached the point where i was relating two initiatives that we have implemented here at the university of the west indies uh the e-learning project that saw modern technology being purchased to give to six special education institutions and to convert uh, um, CSEC exams into sign language for deaf students. And then there's another initiative that we implemented uh, through the sponsorship of the Universal Service Fund, which saw modern technologies in the form of laptops and software being purchased to uh, support students with disabilities studying at the tertiary level and persons with disabilities who are gainfully employed. And we did that initiative based on the research that we had done in terms of access and inclusion of the education system and realized that modern technology was a major challenge to the disabled community. And we have been seeing the benefit from uh, the initiative with, uh, in, the, in the case of the e-learning project, 
between 600 uh, to 800 students with disabilities have benefited from that initiative, and they have been having a fabulous experience in terms of uh, interacting with the modern technology. Then, the, the, with the Universal Service Fund sponsored initiative, we have uh, given a uh, laptop and uh, software to over 150 persons with uh, disabilities who are studying at the tertiary level or who are gainfully employed. And we, last year at the University of the West Indies um, in, in particular, some eight students with disabilities graduate uh, from the institution. And among that eight students with disabilities, you had four who graduated with first class honors. And we believe that the initiative to assist these students with the modern technology has contributed significantly to this sort of outcome where the students are performing extremely well at the tertiary level. And so we believe that if it is that governments should put in place the requisite mechanism to give persons with disabilities the tools in the form of the technology, they will utilize it to the best of their ability and become uh, productive uh, citizens. We have to remember that persons with disabilities are among the most vulnerable within societies. Most of them are unemployed, and in order for them to transform their lives, they have to use education as that means of transformation. And for them to maximize their potential in the education system, they have to get the assistive technology that will assist them in terms of implementing uh, their schoolwork. And the initiatives that have been implemented by the Center for Disability Studies sponsored and funded by the e-learning project of Jamaica and the Universal Service Fund of Jamaica has redound to the benefit of persons with disabilities. And I commend those two initiatives as templates and models that can be utilized to transform persons, the lives of persons with disabilities elsewhere. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you very much. So we've gone, we started a little late and we're still uh, a little within the hour. I just want to open the floor uh, for anyone, perhaps one or two persons who may have questions or any quick feedback to our panel. And while I see one hand, um, Okay, we'll take the one. Could we have a... Okay, good. Good morning. Good morning. My name, Good morning, Ms. Sendrick. My name is Andre Wito. Oh. I am from Deaf Sports Jamaica, and I'm also from Jamaica Deaf Youth Advocacy. Um, um, this question is directed to Floyd Morris. I hope he heard my presentation at the National Youth Parliament. My question for you today is, all the schools who are not under the government, under the Ministry of Education, specifically private schools, um, will they be able to access these services because they are deaf schools? My perspective is, once we are living in Jamaica, all deaf schools should have access to the technology, whether or not they are public or private, because it's for the deaf community to be able to matriculate and to be included. I noticed you said that you have provided laptops and different things through the USF, People who can hear, they are the ones who are normally selected first. And the deaf community tends to be the forgotten community. 
someone went there and said that, you know, they hardly see any deaf person who is on the list for these laptops. So we want to know how we can get access and who works there. And I learned that in 2019, September, um, all the schools will get tablets, um, public schools. I'm wondering if the private schools could be included as well. Thank you for that. Senator? All right. Well, I, for, first I must say that, you know, I can't speak on behalf of the government because I do not have any such uh, governmental responsibilities. I speak on behalf of the Center for Disability Studies at the University of the West Indies that I have responsibility for. And I've always indicated in terms of clarity so that members of the community of persons with disabilities can understand that my role in the parliament is not necessarily for, as a representative for persons with disabilities. My role there is to ensure that I review the laws of the land, and I have taken it on to advocate for persons with disabilities. So I want to make that clear in, before I respond to the, the latter part of his question. I, I don't know who could have indicated that uh, they have seen the list of uh, persons who have benefited from the laptop uh, project, and very few or persons who are deaf have benefited, because there are a number of deaf persons who have benefited from the initiative over the years, and... Um, and, and they continue to benefit. Once we have the, uh, the, the, the resources, and probably your question is appropriate since there are universal service fund representatives there to make sure that they give us more resources so that we can provide more laptops and broaden the pool. Because at this point in time, the project is specific to students with disabilities who are studying at the tertiary level or uh, individuals who are, who are uh, employed. So, you know, we have to make sure that those who are benefiting from the program falls within that particular ambit. Now, we would want to broaden it to make sure that individuals at the lower level in terms of high schools and so forth get um, uh, computers, but that is subject to, uh, to resources, and we know that our good friends at the Universal Service Fund recognizing the benefit of this initiative to persons with disabilities would, um, would be kind enough to uh, give a favorable response to, um, to further funding for the project. Thank you very much, Senator. So with there being no other points, I just want you to join with me in thanking our panelists. Today, they spoke convincingly and completely um, about the, 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 the role of ICTs in, uh, um, in, in society. They spoke of real life stories and events. They spoke of the role of ICTs as an empowering tool, as a tool for communication. They spoke collectively about the therapeutic, psychological role of ICTs. They spoke of the inclusive effect of ICTs in the education system. And they spoke about the equalizing effect of ICTs. Senator Morris, for instance, raised the fact that up to four persons had graduated with first class honors thanks to the assistive technologies that they utilized in the education system. And they spoke about the role of ICTs at all levels of the education system. So altogether, really excellent presentations, a lot of opportunities for lesson learning, for good practice. Um, but importantly, I think what's been underscored, even through the experience of Senator Morris in accessing his presentation today, is the importance of infrastructure in all of this. And that's the note that I want to close on, the importance of infrastructure in enabling accessibility, 
and usability. So thank you very much, audience, for being so patient and join with me in clapping our panelists this morning. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In June this year, the ITU, in partnership with SIDI, Samsung Development Institute for Informatics from Brazil, we have launched together the ITU regional competition for the Latin America and the Caribbean mobile applications for accessibility. This competition aims to promoting the creation and development of new solutions involving mobile applications for any type of platform focused on accessibility. The competition is primarily focused on developing innovative and creative solutions to benefit persons with disabilities, bringing more social inclusion and interaction, comfort and quality of life to their daily routine through mobile technologies. This edition of the competition we have carried, that you have carried out together with Samsung, they were based under two categories. Category one, ideas, solutions, or projects that still need to be developed or that are under development so that target public can enjoy them. And category two, solutions to benefit persons with disabilities that are already developed or available to be used in the market. I have the pleasure to announce the winners of the two categories and invite my colleagues Bruno Ramos and, Thomas, and Cleveland Thomas to deliver the awards to them. So the winner of the category one is Mr. Shaw Maville with the proposal Mobi Assist, Mobile Assist, that in his initiative of Ipsum technology to create assistive device for persons with visual impairment that would enable them to navigate independently. The product, the product provides the user with a real-time feedback about their environment through the wheels of wearable electronics that pairs with an application on their cellular phone. Feedback is provided to the user in the form of audible speech and tattoo vibrations, which allows a visually impaired individual to navigate and avoid oncoming obstacles more effectively. 
So let's show our appreciation and invite Sean Maville to get the award for category one. Welcome, Shaw. Congratulations again. Shaw is, is from Trinidad and Tobago, and he'll have the chance to explain you a little bit more about his product. I invite you, Shaw, to have a seat, please. And then let's also show our appreciation and invite Bruno Mafus from Brazil. The name of his proposal is Guia de Rodas. Guia de Rodas is the largest mobile guide for accessible places. With, with over 150 reviews in more than 60 countries, use it for researching and review places all over the world, accessible or not. Review takes less than 30 seconds in a simple way. Green means that the place is accessible, yellow means partially accessible, and red means not accessible. Use it for planning your outsides with families and friends, and review places your visit to help millions of people to get out of their homes and explore the world. People with disabilities, pregnant, women and elderly, parents with small children, and if you're a self, everybody can benef benefit with Guia de Rodas. Congratulations, Bruno. So I will give the floor to Sean for him to explain a little bit more about his product. Good morning, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here and to accept this award. Okay, so, um, okay, great, the presentation is up. Yeah, do I have to click on? So, so I'm being awarded here for category one, which is an idea under development. Basically, the idea that we worked on, right, um, it's a team of four of us, and we're basically looking at how we can use assistive technologies to help persons with visual impairment, whether they are blind or low vision, to be able to navigate a space without the use of their cane. And so we looked at wearable technologies as a way of doing that. So, I need to meet the team. The first person is Mr. Marlon Pareo. Marlon is a very dynamic speaker. He has lots of ideas. And about four years ago, I met Mar with Marlon at a competition called Startup Weekend. And Marlon pitched the idea that, here's what, I'm blind, and I think that I need something that will be able to help me. And when I listened to Marlon's pitch, I said, wow, you know, if we could have self-driving cars, why can't we develop a device that could help the blind be able to navigate with all the use of the cane? And so I looked at um, the different artificial intelligence algorithms and the sensors that you could use and so we kind of pitched an idea, which was a little bit rough. Um, but at that point, we were able to get enough support for the idea to be able to develop it, um, de develop a good concept. And we won that competition. And after that, we actually applied to 
a program called ID to Innovation. And we were able to get grant funding in order to develop a prototype, which I'll show you a little bit later on. So that's Marlon. Um, Asinat came on the team a little bit later, about maybe about a year afterwards. And um, Winston Blackwood, who is Jamaican, by the way, um, he is the electronics person that would have helped us with the development. And he's, um, he's not here today, but he has played a very influential role in terms of development. So I want to give you a little background about blindness, right? And some of the challenges that people face when it comes to navigating. So I noticed that we have several persons in the room who are blind. Could anybody just stand up for the back? Just so I could um, see the numbers. All right, so I'm seeing two. All right, great. So you all would know these challenges. You all live it. But for the rest of us, we don't really understand it unless you close your eyes and you try to navigate a space, right? Even just outdoor environments or even sometimes the indoor environment can be very hazardous. So there are a couple of key issues. Firstly, you have to know where you are, right? And you have to know where you want to go. So you have to know what correct, what is the orientation you have to, to take in order to get to put your destination. And along the way between you getting to where you want to go, so you have to avoid obstacles. You have to basically avoid collisions. And another thing is that the environment is not static. We live in a changing world. So you have to be able to anticipate when things change around you. So there are a lot of challenges. And so we need to be able to alleviate some of those challenges. But it goes further than that. So when we look at the market, we realize that there is a great need for assistive technologies to help the blind be able to navigate. But when we look in terms of organizations in the Caribbean and what solutions are available, we don't see any, right? There's nothing commercially ready on the market that somebody could use. So we looked at that and we, we looked at how we could actually develop something that would be both aesthetically pleasing, would be reliable, and stuff like that. So in terms of um, the environment, right, we, there are several um, design principles that you need to look at, right? Um, obstacle avoidance is a critical one, right? Um, being able to identify what it is you're looking at. Those are some of the key things that people need to have when you're navigating. Now, I'm going to give you just a little bit of stats. So number 39, keep that number in mind, right? There are 39 million people around the world who are blind. And that means that there's a very, this is a big problem, right? And so if you look at um, that market, what you identify is that most of the people live in developing communities, right? Developing countries. And so you have that there's a challenge of finance, right? Because you don't have the, the money necessary to pay for all of the expensive assistive technologies that are available on the market. So a key consideration for developing this device is ensuring that it is within a price point that the community can pay for it. So we looked also at the market opportunity. And what we noted is that there are several applications which are available on the phone that do help um, persons with disabilities, in this case, um, visual impairment, to navigate. But none of them really take into consideration the challenges that people have with avoiding obstacles. So let me tell you where you are in the in city. And it may help you get to a particular location, but along the way, you're going, to engage, you're going to encounter obstacles. So we looked at what is commercially available. And uh, you'll see from the image as well that we're looking at what is on the development. And so the Connect C, which is basically one of those Microsoft products, they're using that here to be able to navigate within a space. 
But of course, it's a major drawback to it, which is it's very bulky. And in my case, when I show you my prototype, you'll also see that it's very bulky as well, right? So we have to look at avenues that we can take to actually um, reduce the size of the technology and make it much more acceptable so that people can wear um, these assistive devices without feeling like you know, you're standing out. So, our ICT solution. Basically, we need to develop the Mobius prototype to be able to navigate within a 10 by 10 space, right? So you could actually detect up, um, obstacles within a particular range. Um, for calibration purposes, to kind of mimic um, what it would be like if someone had vision, we allowed for you to, the person, to detect within 10 feet and just three feet to the sides so that they, it doesn't give too much information because that is a major problem. Too much information could also lead to confusion. So, we, with the, money, with the financing that we got from the eye to eye, we engaged the University of Western East Electrical Engineering Department to develop a prototype that you see here, and which I have on stage, which I'll demonstrate to you as well. Well, show you at the end of it, right? And so we used several ultrasonic sensors together with a microprocessor and um, Bluetooth to communicate back with the cell phone. And the cell phone then processes the information on it and says to the blind individual, in this case, Marlon, left clear, right blocked, right clear, left blocked, just to give you some guidance. Now, we could have given much more elaborate instructions, but one of the things that we found from doing research is that people don't necessarily want to be bombarded with too much information. So the simplicity of the instruction was more or less a strategy to ensure that they are able to get what they want without having too much um, mental processing to do in analyzing that information. In addition to that, there's also the need for you to hear what's going on around you, right? So we had to ensure that it was simple. They could focus on the instruction, but at still the same time, take into consideration all of the different activities that are going on around them. So I want to demonstrate to you now in terms of, um, this is us here, this is Marlon and myself in the lab. And I'm going to show you Marlon utilizing the device to be able to navigate several obstacles. And you're also going to see the developers at the engineering laboratory who will be giving a little bit of information. So could you play that for me now? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'll say it was difficult. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. So we did this back in 2014, right? We, we, as you can see, we were able to develop a prototype that demonstrates that it can be done. We need the support in terms of taking it from simply having a prototype to a product that we could distribute on the market. And so that, that's actually a very big leap in terms of ICT development and in the Caribbean because without the investor support or sometimes even the knowledge, it's a bit of a challenge. So one of the things that we have to look at right now is how do we miniaturize the electronics? How do we um, create the PCB boards or um, custom make those things so that we could actually have the intellectual property protection in place, right? Um, the aesthetics behind it, right? There needs to be industrial designers who could look at it and maybe place the appropriate um, design in terms of how do we make it wearable, right? How do we make it nice so that people would not feel or how walking through the streets with this device on them. It could, be, could become a seamless part of, of their daily living so that the people may not even recognize to some extent that they're depending on technology to actually navigate, All right? So I want to end my presentation by stating that the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision, All right? And this was by Helen Keller. And Helen Keller wrote several books, but I remember reading as a child, um, you know, Helen Keller's story. Fortunately, I had um, parents who allowed me to learn about different things. And so I had the experience of reading about the blind and her experience growing up as a child being both deaf and blind and how she was able to, to um, overcome her challenges. And she had a tutor who was able to give her some help um, teaching her how to communicate using her fingers, which was really interesting. In addition to that, I guess I could share as well in terms of me, um, I've worked, I've, I've gone to school with several friends who were hearing impaired. So part of me growing up, I always had some influence in terms of interacting with people with disabilities and understanding their needs, right? So this is one of the reasons why I'm here, because when I saw um, Marlon, I thought, hey, I could work on a device with him and uh, it would, I could give back in some way, right? But what I really want to say with respect to that is sometimes the way in which we educate students, there's a somewhat of a division between persons who have disabilities and persons who um, you know, don't. And if it is we were to have the both groups educated together, then there's a lot of amazing things that could happen. So I really want to end with just that statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean, and congratulations again. Oh, it's a gift for me. Okay, so I actually have the device here that you have seen Marlon demonstrating. And um, yes. as you can see, there are the electronic sensors, ultrasonic sensors are on here. It's an array of nine of them. And basically they're pointed in different, at different angles just to kind of pick up what may be on the ground or at um, head level height and at about 180 degrees in terms of in front of you. So you get to see um, things to your side as well, All right? Um, we have at this point here, and as well as at this point here, we have um, vibration um, motors that would allow for tactile feedback. So for instance, if somebody is both deaf and blind, 
it can help, right? So they would not necessarily rely on the audible portion of it. They would rely on the, the vibrations to tell them what's in front of them or to the sides, right? Um, so anybody who wants to probably um, see the device, get to probably interact with it, they can come and check me afterwards. All right, thanks. Thank you, Shaul. Okay, so I have the pleasure to, take, to invite you to take the floor, Bruno. Muito obrigada por vir. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Muchas gracias. My name is Bruno Mafos. And I really need to say that it's an honor to be here with you. Where is my presentation? Well, I have been paraplegic for 17 years. Since a bus hit the car I was in. And from this day on, I have been collecting several unpleasant experiences because of the lack of accessibility. Thank you. Impacting not only my life, but also people around me. Situations like having to leave a friend's birthday in a hurry because there was no accessible toilet for me. Or not being able to attend a corporate event like this because the only access was by stairs. Situations and frustrations like this are the routine of my life and millions of people with restricted mobility. So, physical accessibility is necessary for people with disabilities. But only for them. My slide. Oops. Of course, no. It's also good for people in all ages. Ah, okay. Thank you. Accessibility is good for parents with small children, for someone with a temporary limitation like an injury or pregnancy, for old people. It's good for everyone. And it's good for business because accessible places are able to serve more and more customers. But breaking down and rebuilding every single place in the world, it's obviously impossible. But to encouraging people to pay attention to this seems to be very reasonable. And that's why I've created Guia de Rodas app, a collaborative guide for searching and reviewing the accessibility of places all around the world. Review is quick, intuitive, and can be done by anyone. Let's check it out, a short video. Can you imagine stopping for some coffee in the morning and not being able to get in? Or arriving after a long trip, busting to go to the bathroom and not being able to use it in a hotel room you booked two months in advance? Or not going to a friend's birthday party to give them a hug and a present because you can't get in. This is how millions of people with mobility difficulties feel. Because of the lack of information, they find many obstacles when they leave home. To make life easier for these people, Guia de Rodas was created. It's a collaborative app to evaluate and check the accessibility of facilities. It's user-friendly and intuitive. Look how easy it is to use. Right on the first screen, you'll see the places around you. Choose from the menu the kind of facility you're looking for. You can refine your search or choose specific places or facilities. On the left, you can see the places rating on Foursquare. On the right is the places accessibility rating evaluated by Guia de Rodas users. A green icon means the place is accessible for people with mobility difficulties. Yellow means partially accessible. Red, inaccessible. A gray icon means the place hasn't been evaluated yet. As you select a facility, you'll see the place's details. 
To evaluate its accessibility, touch the pink button. The questions are simple. Anyone can answer them. For example, do you consider this place accessible? Is there a parking space close to an entrance? And so on. And if you're not sure, you can skip it. An evaluation takes only 30 seconds. So be a part of this initiative. With your cooperation, more people will be able to travel, hang out, or simply buy coffee in the morning. Guia de Rodas. When an idea is good, it's good for everyone. That's Guia de Rodas. Thank you. Thank you very much. The tool is available in Portuguese, Spanish, and in English, and I invite you, all of you, to download and to use it. It will help millions of people. Um, everything we've done until now has been done with a strong passion, with our own resources. Our current goal is to act globally, And for that, we need partners, we need investment, we need you. But to tell you the truth, folks, our greatest goal is to one day cease to exist. The world will be an accessible place for all. And an initiative like Guia de Rodas will no longer be necessary. Thank you very much. Let's take a picture, Sean. Let's take a picture. Congratulations, Sean. Congratulations, Bruno. We are proud of you. And we are certain that those brilliant ideas will bring more social inclusion for persons with disabilities. Uh, I have the pleasure to announce that the Mobile and Wireless Forum will open the apps database of Gary to the winners, so you can get in touch with Aderbal, who is here, and uh, he'll have the pleasure to explain you more about that. We are also to thank Samsung Brazil for the support of, for this competition. I know that we are running out of time, but I would like to, to check with the protocol if you have like 10 minutes more. Is that possible? It's okay? Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Uh, since you were talking about awards, and you may recall that yesterday in my presentation, I mentioned the ITU Tic Tac activity for girls from public schools. One of the workshops carried, carried out last November doing, um, in Brazil, it was hosted by the, the Federal Institute of Brazil. And during this uh, event, uh, one of the workshops carried out was the one of digital storytelling. One story was selected, and I have the pleasure to show the video made by the student, Daniele, in the first contact that she has with the feature of the digital storytelling. Desde pequena, gostos peculiares. Gostar de sair no mato com meu pai, amar construções, mexer com animais um tanto perigosos. Gostar de luta, mas ser só parte delicada. Gostar de comprar roupas. I like to buy clothes, spend money on my hair Desde and beauty products. Since I was a little kid, I've always had peculiar ideas. I like to go out to the country. I love construction. I love to play. With... Gostar de luta, mas ser só parte delicada. Gostar de comprar roupas, de gastar muito com cabelo e outros produtos. Essa sou eu. 
Entre uma família um tanto machista, ser uma garota que gosta de coisa de menino. Minha mãe e meu pai nunca me apoiaram muito. Apoiaram quando criança por achar que seria passageiro, mas não foi. Quando contava os planos de fazer engenharia, era contrariada. Minha mãe com sonho que a filha fosse na carreira da saúde e meu pai na área de humanas. Ah, filha, não tem muito mercado para mulher. Sempre odiei essa frase, porque homem tem e mulher não. Mas em muitas coisas, sempre tive o apoio do meu pai. Acho que pela falta de um filho homem que saísse muito com ele, meu refúgio sempre foi ele. Muitas das vezes, minha mãe pode ser um pouco difícil e eu e ele desabafamos e temos forças um no outro. Desde muito pequena, sempre fui a melhor em matemática. Os meninos ficaram desconfortáveis. Uma garota sendo a melhor em matemática? Sim, eu era a melhor. Sempre procurei conteúdos que me davam desafios. Sempre gostei de me superar e tive a sorte de ter professores que me apoiaram. Desde o ensino fundamental, tive o um sonho de estar em grandes reuniões, ser uma pessoa reconhecida. No ensino médio, por acaso, descobri o um Instituto Federal. Hoje, terminando ainda o primeiro ano, já posso dizer está sendo a melhor oportunidade que já tive, onde faço técnico em eletrônica, onde posso provar para todos que falaram que coisa de menina é ficar em casa, que eu posso. Onde eu encontrei muitas pessoas que mais do que apoiam o meu sonho, que ajudam a realizá-lo. E hoje, depois de muitas piadinhas, julgamentos, eu posso dizer que eu consigo e eu vou. Lugar de garota é sim, onde ela quiser. Thank you again for your time. Uh, we are concluding the session. Congratulations again for you both. Thank you for accompanying us this morning. And thank you to Daniele to give us the opportunity to show the Tic Tac video. I invite you again to join us in ITU with the hand, the Tic Tac initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you would agree with me. It has been a wonderful morning thus far. Yes, yes, yes. It's okay to clap. I know that this is the last day, and usually on the last day, we all like to leave here on time. And to ensure, just like on the airplane, where they say we would like an on-time departure, we would like an on-time departure today. As such, we're going to break for a networking coffee break, but only for 15 minutes. So I'm going to ask you kindly to only spend 15 minutes. It's in Jamaica, in terms of Nyaman Scrum. Just come back, quickly eat, and come right back inside. So I'm going to ask you kindly to do that because our next session promises to be wonderful. And unfortunately, if you're not in the room, we're still going to start. All right, 15 minutes. Thank you.
check on. Ladies and gentlemen, we shall be restarting in approximately three minutes. Three minutes.
Ms. Roxanne. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, can I invite you kindly to take your seats? We're about to begin our next session. Ladies and gentlemen, could you kindly take your seats? Thank you so much. We will recall that yesterday we had a, had a very special session that we traversed to today's proceedings. That is our interactive session where as participants we have the opportunity to interact and give our contributions on good practices for digital inclusion. This session will be led by none other than the Senior Program Officer for Digital Inclusion at the International Telecommunications Union, Mrs. Roxanne Wittmer Ilinescu. I hope I got that right. I'll call her Roxana from now on. Roxana works with the ITU and has been working with this entity since 1988 when she joined the ITU's Development Bureau. In 2003, the ITUD, which is a development bureau, gave her a, new portfolio, gave her a new portfolio to promote digital inclusion of youth and indigenous peoples. Ladies, I'm, I'm, I'm pausing. May I have an interpreter, please? I realize we don't have an interpreter. May I have an interpreter, please? Sure, thank you. Yes, please. I only need one minute. An interpreter. Roxana, could you join me on stage, please?
Our next session will be moderated by, as I mentioned earlier, Mrs. Roxana Wittmer Ilenescu. Roxana has been working with the International Telecommunications Union since 1988 when she joined the ITU's Development Bureau. In 2003, the Bureau gave her a new portfolio to promote digital inclusion of youth and indigenous people. And since then, the mandate has been extended to persons with specific needs to include women, children, and persons with disabilities. As a, as a senior program officer, Roxana develops and manages initiatives, activities, and projects that enables these groups to leverage their social and economic development through knowledge, access to, and use of ICTs. In 2008, she was appointed the ITU's focal point for persons with disabilities to assist and advise ITU member states and sector members on digital inclusion. She has a background in education and a master's degree, I'm so sorry, she's a background in law and a master's degree in international law and strategic management of telecommunications. She speaks four languages, English, French, Romanian, and Spanish. Help me make welcome, please, Mrs. Ilinescu. Thank you very much for this introduction. But in fact, this session, it's your session. So I will be here just to moderate and to try to collect your thoughts with regard uh, the presentation that we had the pleasure to listen up to now. I think there were many inspiring presentations, a lot of success story that uh, you had the opportunity to see. We also share some challenges and from time to time, these are even more important than the success stories, because in this way, we can avoid making the error that other people uh, were doing or uh, done. We also um, saw a lot of good practices and achievements in ICT accessibility. So I have here a note. And I want you to express a wish list. I want you to feel free to share whatever you would like to see with regards to ICT accessibility implementation in your country, in this region, in the world. And I thank you in advance for your contribution. So please feel free. This is a moment to express yourself. This is a moment to take the floor in case if previously you didn't have this opportunity. So let's try to build together a wish list, which I can assure you will be included as a result of this regional event, Accessible Americas 5. And this, it will be posted in the website. So let's try to give some guidelines through this wish list of what government, private sector, operator, industry makers, and academic members, and even DPOs would have to do in order to jointly implement this ICT accessibility for all and jointly build this digital inclusive societies. So the floor is yours. Come on. Please. May I have some support with uh, several micas, please? I have here some, some micas that Do you want me to just give it to some people? And it's let a lady. Them... I would just please, so introduce yourself, only your name, and uh, okay. if it is an operator address, so either it's a private sector address, operator to all, whatever. Please be brief and concrete. Thank you. 
Good morning, Maria Kelly, Bahamas. What I would like to see in my country is public transportation for the disabled. We don't have public transportation for the disabled, nor do we have talking ATM machines as yet. What else do we need? <laughs> um, also, we are working on standards. We don't have proper standards that um, will assist in the um, compliance of our act, which was implemented in 2014. Thank you, Maria. Someone else, please? Let's try to be a little bit more active. Use this time. This is your time. Uh, Conrad Harris, Jamaica. Uh, one of the things I want to see is that all the Caribbean governments will sign off on the Marrakesh Treaty so that the many, many digital books that are available though, that cannot be exchanged can now be available to all. Um, another thing that I would love to see is, you know, as we know, a lot of the technology is already available. There are many persons who are not able to afford them. One of the things I'm thinking of is that if we probably had a system where uh, we, we, we had a program where we were maybe refurbishing used phones, used phones, um, cell phones or used tablets, etc., um, and giving it to those persons, then that would at least um, provide an initial step into the technology field for some of those persons. Oh, yes. Um, one other issue as well is that, um, as somebody who's blind, I would like to be able to be able to tell what is on the television, choose what program I can watch, because I am, I, I am able to um, read the display and know what is coming on when the, the program schedules. Thank you very much. Someone else? Please, the lady here. Hi, morning. Um, I guess Jamaica, Jamaica Association for the Deaf, Kimberly Sherlock. My initial recommendation is one that I think has been forgotten for a number of years now, and we've had discussions with the relevant authorities and we're not seeing much progress. Captioning on television is, at this point, I'm gonna call it basic bare minimum. Um, the news is not accessible, and so with information needed um, to ensure that there is, whether it's a zone of special operation, it's a hurricane coming, that needs to be made accessible for the community. So if, if nothing else, closed captioning, ideally an interpreter on television, but closed captioning I think would be the simple way to get started. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Very good suggestion. Someone else? No wish list? It's a wish list. Hi, my name is Tanise Ellis. I'm from the University of the West Indies. Excuse One me, the... I didn't understand. My name is Tanise Ellis. Yes. I'm from the University of the West Indies. One of the things I'm hoping that we will get to is where all of our curriculum, they are designed from the from the very beginning with accessibility for all as a part of what is and how the curriculum is um, designed and delivered so that we're not waiting until our lecturers know that there's a student with some disability in their class and they're gonna try to adjust their delivery method or their presentation, but it's already a part of how they teach and what they teach. So if they are doing a PowerPoint presentation, there is the captioning, there is a audio also available for, for persons to, to, to hear. Um, so all of the various things that will make the material that they're presenting accessible, not only at a tertiary level, but even at a high school level or below, that our teaching curriculum is prepared from the very beginning as accessible for all. Excellent. I'd also like to make just one last note that a number of our lecturers 
at, again, at the tertiary level, they are very willing and they are very cooperative and they do the very best they can to accommodate our students with any disability. But one of the things that they continue to say to me in my own research is that they are not prepared. Some of them didn't go through teachers' colleges, so they, they would not be, pair, be prepared for a certain type of delivery. So if something could be done at the university level to prepare our lecturers um, to be able to teach a diverse classroom, because I agree with mainstreaming, that students with whatever ability, whatever level of ability, should be able to come into the classroom and a teacher is prepared and ready to deliver that material for the students to benefit. Thank you very much. You said that I can give you the rest of the wish list. Uh, Are you so sure you really want this? This is opening a can of worms. It's a long list. But OK, so um, just adding, one of the things is resources for our classrooms, particularly in the deaf community. This is me up here, right here, Roxana. Right here, OK. Classroom Excuse resources. Me, I, just sorry for interrupting. I'm trying to really reflect every single thing that you are saying, the most accurate possible, because it's coming from you, and I don't want to. And uh, I would much appreciate, uh, yes, it's true, I'm speaking even almost five languages, but English is my fourth one, so please bear with me, and if you can speak a little bit more closely. I'm trying to catch up also with uh, some captioning. So the captioning is good for all, not for only for persons with disabilities, good also for me. So, uh, sorry. So, yes, okay, I'm so all I'll, yours. I'll it simple. Classroom resources. Yes. Um, oftentimes they are presented in a very hearing way. Um, so it's modifying classroom resources so that they're accessible for deaf students. I'm gonna ask a big ask, but if we could get LED screens or some kind of visual support in all service delivery points. So in two words, this is for academic members to ensure that they have the necessary resources. So this is also in the academic, academia. Okay, so ensure the necessary resources to make possible attendance of everyone. Okay. Sure, appropriate resources. All right. Okay. And then service delivery in like hospitals, in banks, in government offices, in police stations, having information in a visual way so that a deaf person can be able to access the services. We can use technology with the screens with, in the same way that we have logos flashing behind you showing all the persons supporting. We can have a similar system in our public support service areas to make life a little bit easier. Yes, I was just thinking that most of this can be achieved if all of them will have websites accessible and their products and, and services make it in a way to be accessible to all. Yes, very good one. Okay. Uh, yes, Please. good morning. Good morning. So my name is Tendi Henry, and I'm from the Institute of Jamaica. Uh, this is a cultural organization. And one of the things that I would love to see happen is for all our our infrastructure be accessible to all. Uh, we have old buildings that were created in, you know, how many hundred years, and steps are the, you know, they're very inaccessible. And um, so when you are, this is, um, is not related to ICT. What you try to say is accessible transportation and, okay. So, so I, it's not necessarily an ICT ask, but you know, it's a wish list. Is there if, Article 9 of the uh, Convention think, of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? Because, because yeah. I think if, we, if, if, you're, if you have a museum and sure. you have accessible content in the museum, but people can't get into the museum, as Bruno said, then it defeats the purpose of even having accessible content. 
um, make a lot of sense. So that would be one thing that I would love. But in an ICT way, for persons who are, you know, have websites and, are, and don't have the skills to create accessible websites, to have maybe a, a forum or a group of persons who will just assist them in making the websites accessible. Next one. Hi. I definitely echo what everyone else has already said for the wish list. But I did want to add something. <laughs> I think really the core at part of this, making the wish list happen for ICT, to make it become a reality, there must be. And that is obviously the biggest challenge that we face is the funding in almost every country that we represent. So I think technical solutions, for the most part, those actually fit. But if funding will continue to just talk about the same wish list and the same challenges for years and years and years to come. So I think we need to prioritize the dialogue and select an appropriate level of funding to get us through this public partnerships, governments, um, an incentive program, whatever type of fund, but we can make as long of a wish list as we want, and without funding, wish list will never ever become a reality. So I think we must focus on funding and get that mechanism figured out. Thank you, very pertinent observation. Right, Lady? thank you. My name is Bernadette Lewis. I'm from the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. I think one of the things I'd certainly like to see is the removal of tax, taxes for, and, or, and or the subsidization of the cost of smart devices and ICT tools uh, for people with disabilities. I also think that there is a need for greater levels of a regional cooperation and collaboration there are tremendous benefits to be derived if we could uh, work together, um, not just the organizations that represent people with disabilities, but also from the governmental point of view. They absolutely have a role to play. And one of the things I think they could certainly work towards is some sort of master plan for the region that each country would take and uh, 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 customized to the unique circumstances on the ground in the various countries. So those are my three wishes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, good morning. My name is Leslie Sobers. I'm from the Guyana National Broadcasting Authority. I would like to first of all commend the young engineer from Trinidad who worked on the, those sensors. And I was wondering whether he can, maybe even not now, maybe later, advise me whether the sensors have taken into account people's rate of movement, because some persons walk faster than the other than others, and so you know, the, the the feedback signals may vary depending on how quickly a person might move. The wishes that I have, and this is for industry developers is that we in the Caribbean region uh, could be able to access hearing aids that have Bluetooth capability so that persons entering into public buildings can uh, hear announcements, persons with hearing impairment, which means also that our public places and our public institutions would also have to ensure that they are able to transmit public broadcasts in those spaces by way of Bluetooth. So a person entering can automatically uh, be connected and hear what's being said. The other wish I would like to share is for the industry, also in the Caribbean, to take into account persons in families who want to watch television. Now, <clears throat> there are the persons with hearing impairments who can see the television but can't hear properly and might need to connect a hearing device. 
but when a hearing device is connected, it shuts off the speakers. So all the members of the family would not be able to hear. Perhaps it can be designed that a speaker could, the speakers could still be on even while an earpiece is connected to the device so that all persons in the family could comfortably enjoy the same show and, and <clears throat> have access to the same information. And I want to take that a little further. There are persons who are visually impaired, who can hear, and who would understand songs coming from the television by way of speech or music, but would not be able to appreciate the context in which the discussion is going on or the music is being played. I noticed just outside in the concourse an instrument that prints onto paper braille, and so persons with, uh, hear, with visual impairment would be able to read. Could the industry develop also something similar that would describe scenes on television, which means that the set would have to have the capability of communicating with whatever instrument to describe the scene. So take, for example, if a discussion is taking place uh, at the, on the sidewalk, uh, the person with hearing ability but visual impairment would understand that the discussion is going on, but the instrument would uh, automatically, in real time, describe that this discussion is taking place on the sidewalk, so that even those with visual impairment or blind altogether would enjoy the show and understand the scene in which uh, sure. the discussion is going on. Sure. Uh, there are already in place such um, such tools, so I believe you are referring to closed captioning for visually impaired. And uh, yes, uh, I'll, I'll make a wrap up at the end, so definitely. I too also develop um, some guidelines for governments on this, and so Everything is possible. This is something that definitely can be done. Thank you. Well, we have 10 more minutes. I need five to wrap up. So uh, last two, three questions as a maximum, please. Hi, good morning. My name is Antoinette Aiken. I have been an official sign language interpreter for Jamaica for 11 years. Um, one of the things that I admired about this conference is that we're always, we're speaking about inclusion and inclusivity, but one of the things that I have recognized while being an interpreter is that we tend to pick our interpreters for a deaf community without their input, and because somebody come and say, hey, I can sign, or hey, I have this ability, does not necessarily mean that they are providing the accurate service for the community. And so as an interpreter, and I'm not just an interpreter, I grew up with deaf parents, so I'm a coder. And I realized that we have this tendency to just do things for deaf, the deaf community without even including them. And there's this saying that always goes around, that nothing about us or nothing for us without us. But I realized that the deaf community is the forgotten community. It's the community that we last planned for. It's the community that, hey, we made an entire budget for ICTs, for this sector, that sector, that sector. Um, interpreters, can you give us a discount, please? Because we didn't remember to book you. That is exactly what the deaf community faces. Now, I've been doing it for 11 years, and I've been getting the same money for 11 years. There is no profession that you get the same pay for 11 years. There is none, unless you work for the government, of course. And so, 
The only reason why I'm still committed is because I believe, I watch my parents suffer. I watch them go into the bank. I watch people discriminate against them just because of language differences. Nothing else. They're, they don't have any other difference, just a language difference. So my wish is for us to really empower deaf people, for them to make their own decisions, for them to decide what's best for them, not for a hearing person or somebody who, oh, I know what this means. You don't know because you haven't lived it. You haven't experienced it. So your perspective is totally different from the perspective of somebody who has lived it. And so when we are, make, when we are having conferences and when we're having plans, we should always have the deaf person at the table at the start, not at the end, and then say, hey, we're inclusive, just because we have a few photos of deaf people in the front or at the back. We should always plan with them at the start. And that is what I want to see for the world. And I also want to see hearing people signing with deaf people, communicating normally on a regular basis without me. Every time I'm there, oh, come here, come here. I want you to tell them what I'm saying. Try, have a conversation. They understand. They have been doing it their whole life. They have been doing it their whole lives, trying to match you and go to your level because they realize that you will never be able, you are not willing to go to their level. So that's what I want to see after this conference. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think the last question was from Monica. Uh, and then, please, just very short, because I would like to wrap up everything to ensure that everybody... Bye. Sigue, Monica, ¿te escucha? ¿Se escucha? ¿No se escucha? Yudeli Wickham Ashby, Barbados. And on my wish list, it really centers around employment, making ICT, the technology really available to employees with disabilities through some type of subsidy or incentivized, incentivized approach so that the employers are willing to really embrace persons with disabilities in the workforce. Excellent. Thank you very much. Monica? And I also saw a lady here on the first row. So if Monica is short, I also like to accommodate this last call. No te escucho. I just wanted to add on the employment line of, of idea that it's not just only to see a technology, accessible technology available, but I would love to hear more of best practice for a digital skills because everyone needs digital skills in order to enter the labor force. So what are the best practices and good examples in, within the region to create digital skills for everyone, and I'm not just talking about persons with disabilities, but for everyone in order to be able to get better jobs. Thank, Thank you. A very last and short call for this lady here. So just to accommodate everybody, and then we'll wrap up. This is for you. Can anybody give? Hi, good day. Good day to everyone. My name is Tashai Whitmer, and I am the manager for the CCCD for the Deaf. So there are two things that I would like to see. The first one is available funding and opportunities related to funding for education, um, to have a welfare program or scholarship program established through ICT, you know, so that we can have more information technology opportunities for university and college 
for the development of our CCCD schools. We'd really like to see that happen. And secondly, as it relates to ITU, I'd like to see where we can develop something in print and in sign language. So also we have international signs. So sign language would vary across the world, but we'd have something that each deaf person could use for access. Thank you very much. So I think the organizer already ended my time, but I will try in two minutes to wrap up a little bit and at the end you let me know if I have to add something. So we begin with Mary from Bahamas who um, actually called for public transportation for persons with disabilities and remind the related standards. I have to say that ICT and transportation are both in the same article of the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disability, Article 9. So definitely we have to merge this one and we have to work together. We also had the comment from um, Jamaica with regard to the Caribbean government to sign the Marrakesh Treaty. Uh, of course, um, we have to provide digital uh, books available for all because this will lead to education. We also discuss about TV accessible several person uh, mentioned about this and um, I have to say so yes it was also from Trinidad who addressed some thoughts to industry we have to provide accessible TV solution there is closed captioning available there are a lot of tools available uh, perhaps the, the standards should be put in place but definitely everything is there outside Governments just have to try to um, implement this. Um, captioning in TV, so we already mentioned. Universities. Uh, several person um, mentioned about the curriculum of the university that should be available also for persons with disabilities. And I will say that this is a win-win because as discussed during the training, if we manage to train this person with disability to provide them education and then uh, employment opportunities, uh, it's a win-win also for the government. Not only for the personal, social and economic development of person with these disabilities, but for all of us. Uh, definitely, we also discussed about the infrastructure uh, of um, um, the job um, that are um, available. So if we want to include persons with disabilities, we also have to provide them appropriate infrastructure in order to enable them to, to do properly their work. Um, also for the academia, um, in our wish list we're including to um, well, this is not only for the academia, I would say. It was modify classroom resources um, uh, and also in hospital books, government offices. Um, yes, I believe that this is um, a common effort that we have to, to call for. So it's also government, but it's also public uh, sector, um, operators, everyone. Um, we have from now on to, to have this inclusiveness from the design stage. Rather, it is in architecture, exactly the same in technology. And um, just to share that uh, we do have some training available also for, for the banks and um, we implement in, in Arab states, so why not here? And in Mexico, I think uh, Monica already mentioned that uh, there were such short training available. Um, again, Jamaica was indicated about 
all infrastructure uh, available for all. And, um, well, the fact that you cannot access in the museum, even if the museum has the necessary um, ICT structure to, to provide information, if you cannot physically access, uh, definitely you cannot access the information. So it's another barrier. Funding. Um, it was requested to find some solution. And I do think that, yes, funding is very important. Um, I don't have yet a solution, but I would challenge you to think to the Universal Service Fund. A very good practice on this, I don't know if Costa Rica mentioned uh, this time, but uh, the uh, director of SUTEL is here with us, Umberto. So if some of you would like to have some good practices on this, I think this is right or at least one of the possibility that you can look at on how to include a person with disabilities and related facilities in the Universal Service Fund. And of course, then everybody, like in house, we, we all manage our own budget, so we have to establish priorities. We have to see which is really the most important and how to begin, and this is only uh, possible if we all get together and um, try to to establish which are the the priorities so that's why it's very important that this type of meetings happens at the regional level to interchange experience but also it's important that the countries together get together and based on their own realities put a plan with milestones <clears throat> and uh, trying to, to give a timeline for implementation of all this. Uh, I'm always at the end. Um, industry, yes, uh, access of uh, hearing aids to access public places, transportation, again, TV solution for uh, visually impaired. So, uh, yes, uh, all these applications are available. I think uh, we only have to be very careful with regard to the, the security issue. I remember that um, the gentleman that is right there uh, mentioned something on the security issue. So, yes, we have to get together to put together all the related knowledge. So the wish, the knowledge, and the resources and find the appropriate solution on, on this. Um, yes, it's not last and it's not the least, the, um, the involvement of persons with disabilities. Please, uh, it's, it's not just words. It's definitely compulsory. It's a sine qua non condition. Do not do anything with regard to ICT accessibility for persons with disabilities without involving them from the very beginning. So, um, yes, the um, accurate service for um, uh, deaf community the sign language, of course, is a very challenging situation because, as you mentioned, there are several sign languages. Even here in the, in the region, you have several sign languages. And it's a cost issue. Uh, however, I would say that there are now in place some application, and U.S. already have it for over 10 years of relay services. So perhaps meanwhile, you can look at and jointly with the government, industry, private sector to put in place these services from, from the start of anything. And um, yes, employment, make, making ICT available to be inclusive for persons with disability. Uh, I will just mention that the web accessibility program, considering that require that every single work that is done by the communication officer and by the webmaster be validated by person with disabilities, 
these also generate work for persons with disabilities. And this was also the case in, in Costa Rica, I believe, with uh, Alexa. So very last, Dasha Wittmer um, mentioned about funds for education, establishment, ICT in university and college. Um, definitely funds we need for everything, but of course, if from the very beginning, the uh, academic members will try to be a little bit more inclusive and adapt their curriculum uh, to, to be able to, to be accessed by all. So definitely this, it will be a win-win value, not only for them as academic member, but for the country as a whole, because these people, as I've told you, will be educated, will have access then to, to job opportunities, and it's good for all. Uh, I have to say that uh, a very last word, standards. Standards were mentioned, and I do believe that standards are out there. We just have to see exactly which are the best that we can have, either in procurement for the government to procure accessible ICTs, either we take the 508 uh, from US or the uh, EN from uh, 301 uh, 549 from uh, Europe, are the same. Everything is the same. We just want to purchase accessible ICT and to increase person with disabilities opportunities. I thank you very much for these thoughts. I have to uh, uh, ensure again that everything will be stated in the final document. Thank you very much. And I finish with a very good news. We have over 96 participants in the training. We have 84 who passed uh, successfully the test and um, during the, the launch break we'll have a list I will invite you all to have your certificate you will all also receive it in electronic form but then in the afternoon everybody with the certificate will make a photo here so please ensure that before entering in the room you will take your certificate um, and the organizer will help us to do so. Thank you very much for all your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roxano. Very, very good. And thank you, participants, for those wonderful suggestions that were made. We're going to move in very quickly into our ill, I'm so sorry, into our 13th session which will be chaired by none other than Mr. Cleveland Thomas. And I'm going to invite Mr. Thomas to join me at the podium. And also the participants in this session, Mr. Andre Coy, Ms. Wendy, I forgive me that I will not be able to bastardize that name. I'm dying to hear how you pronounce it actually. And Mr. Pereira. As they take their seats, I use the opportunity to make to do two quick announcements. All the presentations, that is PowerPoint presentations and videos that have been shown during the course of the conference will be available on the ITU's website as well as on the Jamaica Information Services website. In addition, the transcriptions that you have seen here today, as well as throughout the conference, in both English and Spanish, will also be made available to the participants. Cleveland Thomas, the moderator, is no stranger to us for this week, for these week or last three days. As indicated earlier, he is currently the ITU's representative for the Caribbean and has been working in the ICT sector for over 20 years. He was previously Trinidad and Tobago's representative at the ITU Council and there chaired a number of study groups and rapporteur groups. He possesses a master's degree in information and communications technologies 
and prides himself above all of being a preacher of the gospel. Can you help me make welcome Mr. Cleveland Thomas? Well, it, it's afternoon already, and I know that we have been having some really, really, really good exchanges and discussions, and I know that we are the, that point between you and your lunch, and some of you all are quite hungry. So we don't want to keep you back from that scrumptious lunch that we are used to here. Um, at this time, of course, for those who are not aware, um, we are in session 13, and we are looking at this point towards the implementing, implementation of uh, digital inclusion within the Caribbean region, substantially looking at some of the actions being taken by um, a few of the administrations or agencies as far as promoting digital inclusion um, and social and e economic empowerment of persons with specific needs throughout the Americas. Um, now, I was about to ask or invite everybody to stand and probably shake yourself out, but if I ask you to do that, that might take a bit longer and take away from your lunch. So all I will do now is invite, I have the privilege, of course, of having three distinguished panelists here with us. Um, uh, first, Miss Wendy A. Class Japa Joe. I hope I pronounced that well. She's the acting director, telecommunication authority of Suriname. She will give a brief of herself when she uh, makes a presentation. We have Mr. Andre Coy, um, Department of Physics, the University of the West Indies for Jamaica. And we also have, to the extreme left, Mr. Adebal Pereira. Um, he's the Director for Latin America Mobile and Wireless Forum. So what we will do in that order, let's invite Mr. Coy, first of all, to make his presentation. Um, as I mentioned, we will give each one of our guests um, 10 minutes max to, to make their presentation and thereafter get in the three presentations as we have done before. We will then invite you for some brief exchanges. Mr. Coy, please, can you warmly welcome him? Good afternoon. Uh, I was told mm -hmm. that I could say something more about myself, but I won't, um, because hungry people are angry people. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about some of the things that we're doing at the UE um, with the intention of empowering uh, the deaf. Um, my introduction was actually done for me by some of the participants in the previous session. Um, so I will just go straight into it. So we've estimated that there are about 54,000 deaf persons uh, in Jamaica currently. And uh, it's estimated that around the world, 80% of the deaf do not have access to education. We have approximately 200 children per year in Jamaica who are diagnosed uh, as being deaf. However, we only have about f space for about 400 students uh, in deaf schools. So if we work that out, we can see that we're, we're now at a deficit with, with regard to the education of, uh, of the deaf. Between 2011 and 2016, uh, there are approximately 142 deaf students who graduated from secondary institutions in Jamaica. Uh, and we found that tertiary level graduates were only around 6% uh, of the population as compared to 19% for the overall population for students graduating from tertiary level uh, institutions. So what we already understand and what I would like to re reiterate is that training and educational opportunities for the deaf, they are quite limited uh, and they're limited uh, worldwide, but we see that deficit um, quite clearly in developing countries and in Jamaica in particular. We find that tertiary institutions don't have accessible uh, tools for accessibility. They don't have people who are able to sign. They don't have ICTs. They don't have any of the equipment, the assistive devices that would be useful uh, for the deaf. Business places and other educational institutions don't have ac uh, accessibility for the deaf either. 
So how do we then go forward with empowering the deaf? And I'd like to talk to you about a, a project that we're doing at the UWE, um, Project INCLUDE. It's Inclusive uh, Deaf Education. Because it's essentially, it speaks to the core of what is needed for the deaf. If you are able to educate uh, a vast majority of the population, then their opportunities uh, would, would increase. Their opportunities for development, their opportunities for earning, their opportunities for um, a better life would increase. So there are some solutions that would allow uh, for deaf students to work in situations where there are no interpreters and there are no specific as accessibility devices. There are some projects overseas, in, in the US in particular, that provide things like transcriptions for lectures so the deaf can read what is going on um, on the slides. But there are some limitations to these systems, and these are the limitations that we hope to, uh, hope to address. So one, they assume that the deaf uh, are familiar and fluent in a particular written language. And this isn't always the case. Because as many of you may know, um, sign language isn't simply a transliteration of um, the spoken uh, language. So for instance, Jamaican sign language is not a transliteration of Jamaican English. So if you're producing a transcription that is in English, in Jamaican Standard English, then a deaf person may not be able to understand fully what is being presented, because it's simply not the same thing as they would have signed. Some of these approaches um, do not allow the deaf to use sign language. So we're forcing them to use a non-native language to themselves. This is an issue, because we're asking them to adapt to us, rather than us uh, including them in a holistic way. Most of these solutions do not allow for two-way communication. So either the deaf uh, are allowed to communicate, by sign language, or the instructor communicates with the deaf person using um, English or any other uh, native language. And the final limitation is that many of these solutions are geared toward university students. And so at the lower levels where the basics of their education um, are being developed, many of these students do not have access to a classroom. So Project INCLUDE aims to integrate deaf people deaf students into hearing only classrooms. So there will be no physical interpreter there. There will be no, uh, there will be no need for a physical interpreter. So I could uh, describe the system to you. Um, I was hoping that it would be on the slide, but uh, I can do it uh, without the, the aid of the slide. So imagine a scenario where there is um, a deaf person sitting in a classroom with a a lecturer or a teacher that is not that does not know uh, sign language. You can go to um, slide slide seven. I see you're trying to catch up with me. I do. Thank you. If only I'd known. <laughs> All right, thank you. So. What we're trying to do is to create a closed loop system. So I've mentioned before that you have some systems around that uh, go part of the way. They allow the deaf to communicate or you have a system that allows the hearing person to, to participate in the classroom. What we aim to do is to close that loop. So the idea is if you have a deaf person um, sitting in a classroom, the teacher wants to communicate with this deaf person. The teacher does not know sign language and that teacher also has 30 other students to deal with in the class. So they can't stop and sign to this individual and then go back to speaking um, in English to the others. So what we're proposing is that the teacher would speak as uh, she normally would. Then she's wearing a microphone, her speech is captured, and automatic speech recognition translates that into some kind of text. Then the text transcription is translated into Jamaican Sign Language and that Jamaican Sign Language text drives a signing avatar, which is simply an animation that will sign for the deaf student to see. And so this teacher speaks, the avatar signs, the deaf person understands. I'm not done yet. <laughs> You're going to be even more amazed. Um, when the deaf person wants to communicate, then they simply sign as they naturally would, 
that is captured by uh, a device such as a camera or some other third-party device such as a Microsoft Kinect. Um, it's then translated into some kind of transcript which is then uh, used to drive a speech, um, a speech synthesis system which then allows the teacher to hear what was signed. And so you have a closed loop system where both a teacher and deaf student are allowed to communicate in their native language and be able to understand each other. So we are in uh, the early stages of this project. Um, we've done some consultations with the Jamaica Association for the Deaf um, and we have further consultations to do. We also need to and will be in contact with the deaf community because as was rightly said, we have to include uh, them at the very design stage. Um, we are technical persons, we may think it's a wonderful uh, solution and then you bring it to the deaf and they say, well, this is just completely useless, I cannot use it. And in fact, you need to start over. So we're uh, doing consultations as we speak. So uh, we can think about some of the benefits as I, as I wrap this up. So this, this solution is portable. So all you need are a few uh, cameras, uh, some microphones, um, and a, a computer, of course, to do all the processing in the background. So you can take this pretty much anywhere, to any classroom, you can take it to university level, you can start at primary school level, you can take it to institutions that deal with lifelong learning. So it's a portable solution. Um, we, the integration of the deaf into the classroom uh, is going to be also useful because it will change the attitude of the hearing toward the deaf. As was, it was mentioned before, that we uh, don't always have our best interactions with the deaf because we do not understand them. And so we can start to change that culture by bringing this solution to our classrooms. And we're increasing the educational opportunities, uh, the, the prospects for getting jobs, and the prospects for participating uh, in society in a more wholesome way. Um, and that is no less than the deaf deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Coy. Um, a quick question for, for Mr. Coy, anyone at this time? I know we will give the questions later on. Any immediate reactions? Not yet? How many deaf people are there in Jamaica at the moment? 54,000. And what percentage of the deaf person around the world that don't have access to ICT? How much? Who said 80%? Show your hands up. Yeah, 80%? Okay, you are correct. You are entitled to free lunch today. <laughs> we will now invite our colleague now, um, uh, Wendy, you don't mind giving your presentation. Please, could you just warmly welcome her? Yes. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, I'm also happy to be here, and I promise I will keep my presentation very short so we can go to lunch quickly. Um, I'm going to give a br brief background of Suriname because I'm willing to bet that uh, some of you don't even know where that is and probably think it's somewhere in Africa, but it's not. We're not that far away, so I'm going to give a brief description so you can get a feel of what I'm talking about when I, when I continue. And then I'm gonna go into two projects that Suriname and the government of Suriname has been doing. Um, our broadband project and our digital television project. Suriname is in South America. Our neighbors are Guyana, French Guyana, and Brazil. So we are not that far away. Um, I have heard a couple of people stating um, the last two days that they have a small population of a couple of million people. Well, Suriname's population is about 600,000 people. And with our size, that comes to a density of about 2.9 people per square kilometers. So we, are, we have a lot of land and few people. And that is a major challenge for us when it comes to infrastructure and ICT. In Paramaribo, our capital, 
um, the largest population lives about 250,000 people. And then the next two big cities are in Wanika, Nikeri, and Kamowena, with another 200,000 people. And the rest of the community is spread all over Suriname. Um, that makes it quite difficult to get everybody connected. With a, I'm going to go into a little bit of the history. Uh, it wasn't until about not more than a little bit more than 10 years ago, it was impossible if you lived out of Suriname to have any kind of connection, either via fixed line or mobile. In 2007, the government decided that they want to liberalize the mobile telecommunication market, and then it's when it started to get possible to have a mobile phone out of Paramaribo. And it wasn't until 2012 that you could have internet on your phone in Paramaribo. And I'm not even talking about outside of Paramaribo. So, um, in 2013-2014, one of both providers actually started with a rollout of a 4G mobile network and fiber to the home in Paramaribo. I'm not talking to anybody outside of, outside of Paramaribo yet. And in 2015, um, the two local, two government-owned television stations started with transmitting digital um, television um, in Paramaribo and some parts out of Paramaribo. And in 2017, we started with our broad na um, national broadband project. Um, last year, the Telecommunication Authority did a survey, a household survey, and with that survey, we found out that in 2017, 75.6% of households in Suriname had an internet connection. So not even everybody in Suriname is connected to the internet yet. 72% of these households has had used the internet um, in the last three months and 80% used internet daily. Um, and as you can see, most people, 87.7% um, use mobile internet. So with the start of the broadband project, the goals were to expand the internet connection from fiber, um, starting with fiber to the curb and fiber to the home, and to implement e-government. They started in Paramaribo, Nikeri, Kamuwene, and Wanika. And at the moment, um, 31,341 new people were connected to the internet. And those, of those 31,000 people, 23,500 people have at least 10 um, megabytes of internet data spe speed. From October 2018 until October 2019, they are planning to roll out about 815 kilometers of fiber and connecting 14 areas. And then in the second phase, they're going to do nine more areas with 900 more kilometers of fibers. And they are planning to connect at least 50,000 um, new subscribers. So these are the areas in, uh, which, they are, which they are connecting now. And as you can see, most are in Paramaribo, Wanika, Kamowene, and Nikiri. That's where the, the larger number of people are located. And the second phase will be more in Wanika, Kamowene, and one of the other districts, that is Saramaka. This is a little bit of a map. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm clicking on the wrong button. So just to give you an idea of what, how they will be spreading the fiber. And up till today, 
This is the coverage, the 4G coverage that we have right now in Suriname. And as you can see, it's still a lot of, a big part of Suriname is not connected yet. And there are two, three villages of um, Amerindian communities, um, two close to Guyana, Amatopo and Kuruni, and um, two close to the border with Brazil that have no 4G internet connection yet. One of the projects that our government is really proud of is our digital television project, where at the moment, um, all communities outside of Paramaribo have the availability of digital television. The project started in 2009, and with the help of the ITU, we held a regional workshop for the implementation of digital television. Um, it took about another couple of years for the government to finally decide which standard they would be using, and they decided that uh, we would be using two standard, standards, which is also a unique situation in the region. And the implementation started in 2014. So we have two standards, the free-to-air standard and the pay television standard. And the first um, district out of Paramaribo that had digital television was Brocopondo, and they had their connection on July 11, 2014. So it's the first time that these people had television and could watch television. Currently, um, as you can see in the map, um, almost all um, villages in the interior of Suriname have little television. There are 18 um, new um, locations from where they are broadcasting all across um, Suriname. And they're um, supposed to be putting up three more in the next year. And the biggest issue they had with putting up these um, locations were the distance and the ability to get there. I want to go back to the, to the first map. All these locations you see here can only be accessed by airplane. So um, all the equipment to put up the antennas had to be flown in by small airplanes and then brought to the locations by helicopter. And it's also not a picture of how it all was transported. And then I want to end with the map so you can see where in Suriname now has digital television. So we have almost covered all populated area in Suriname. And I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. And um, we'll move um, right away into the final presentation from Mr. Adebal uh, Pereira, Director for Latin America Mobile and Wireless Forum. Please. Are you not going to warmly welcome the guy? Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll try to be quick, fast, everything, in order that we can get quickly to the lunchtime. But anyway, I, I have a message to deliver, and, and uh, I don't know if I have the slides on. Yeah, and I have it in English and in Spanish. Uh, anyway, I, I decided to, 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 to bring this kind of information that you, you see uh, in, a, in a screen. Uh, and it's a kind of an experience that I had uh, something like um, a month ago and, and, you know, a little bit of reflection made me believe that I should take the opportunity of this event to bring some, some alert 
to bring some uh, incentive related to the, the wireless technology in Latin American countries, I mean Caribbean too. And Okay, back. I have the Spanish here and Spanish here, and I have a presentation in English. English is there? Okay. So, uh, Going to this, this, this uh, first part, and, and uh, let me tell you, before we get to this subject, let me tell you what is MWF, what we do, and how we get to the, the accessibility issues uh, uh, interest. Uh, the MWF is an, uh, an international non-profit association of telecommunication equipment manufacturers with interest in the mobile or the so-called wireless communication. And we got to this accessibility issue when we uh, 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 adopted and decided to go uh, that the manufacturers could do something to, to help people uh, with disabilities uh, and then at that time, in 2008, we, we developed the, the Global Accessibility Reporting Initiative, which is still uh, up to now on, in place. And this is, uh, was, it, it's not related to, you know, business. It's related to citizenship. And that's the way that the, the, the manufacturers decided to approach it give information free of charge, no, no uh, uh, financial interest on that. So, and we now provided this uh, Agari and, and it has been adopted for several countries uh, in, the, in the frame of the uh, accessibility of telecommunication. Uh, the, these are the companies that are part of MWF, are the biggest one in, around the world. Uh, just for information, and here's how God is, how, how it looks like. It's a, it's a web page in 18 idioms. Uh, you have there the, the link for, for Gary if one may be interested in that. And it, it was developed for uh, 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 the use of consumers, governments, telecom providers, uh, 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 user organizations, occupational, occupational uh, therapists, and so on. Uh, I have a little problem with the two commands here. So, uh, who, who by the end is, is using Gari uh, are those that I, I mentioned. Uh, and it's, it can be used, and we provide the, the opportunity of these people having uh, uh, access of Gary through their web page that, that can be an embedded web page like the case of IFT in Mexico uh, that has a completely uh, uh, customized web page for giving information to the, 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 the users. Just to, to give some more information, we, we, a feedback, I mean, we, we have uh, uh, all, all these figures that I'm not going to mention related to the, the, the views of the, the, the service, and that doesn't, doesn't include the views that were made in the, the, the web pages of the, the, the organizations that are using Gari. But I, I, I as I mentioned before, I, I didn't decide to come here to, to talk about Gary, I'm just mentioning it. He, the, the, the reason that brought me here to talk about this, about the 5G uh, and the 
and all the uh, high-speed network that are available nowadays. You know, well, I, I'm sure that 5G is the, the uh, coming next generation for wireless communication. Uh, it's already in tests in countries like Japan, Korea, uh, England, also in U.S. It's going to be in test in some Latin American countries during 19. Uh, and 20. But uh, what, what brought me is, uh, to this uh, uh, subject is that I was in, a, in an event, as I mentioned it, in a, in a Latin American country something like a month ago, and we, we were talking about technology, we were talking about uh, uh, science, and there were people from re regulatory area, area of several countries, Latin American countries, present there. And uh, they, 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 they got to the discussion, and in a given moment, someone, and not only one, uh, and we were talking about 5G, and uh, in a given moment, someone said, come on. Do I need 5G? I don't need that. It's uh, just a, a way that the industry is, is, is taking to, to, to develop some uh, uh, precocious obsolescence. And I have 3G, it's working well. Uh, I don't need 5G. And this coming from regulators, coming from people that uh, are developers. Okay, I will be faster. Uh, and uh, I started to explain the guy that 3, 5G is something that comes uh, uh, to, to, to ensure the uh, virtual reality, cars, uh, autonomous cars, things like that. And that 5G enable a, a lot of important things to be done which are not possible to be done to nowadays, including in, in, in terms of, of uh, uh, accessibility uh, applications. Just for having an idea, that, uh, 5G, which is now on the course, uh, the response time of the, the lat latency, the response time is 20 to, to 30, 30 milliseconds. And with 5G, it will go to four to, four to five milliseconds. That means when an when, uh, 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 autonomous car nowadays with 5G uh, finds an obstacle, it breaks and stops in 1.4 meters, something like that. And, and with 5G, it will stop in 2.8 centimeters. So that's the amount of, of response speed that uh, 5G brings. And that comes very becomes very important when you talk about accessibility apps with real-time reaction, inclusive apps with real-time reaction for education, for instance, remote medical assistance, anywhere remote surgeries. This not talking about IoT, autonomous vehicles, virtual reality, practical applications, smart manufacturing, manufacturing and so on. So, do we need 5G? I think that we need, and I, I, and I, I, I would like to bring here an alert. We are in a, in a time where the more important minds dedicated to the study of social science have been agreeing that the humankind is currently taking the first step into a completely new social structure and era. I need two minutes more. Uh, we'll have a, a new society. It's about a new society where the cultural ordination, where people, schools, jobs, professional skills, homes, streets, almost everything and everyone will experience very important positive changes. And 5G is in the middle of this 
uh, if the, the main, if, if not the main, is one of the main tools for put that in place. So, do we need 5G and high-speed networks? Yes, we do need it. We have to take the worst, our generation here. We have to take the responsibility over the present and future generation in terms, and I mean regulators, developers, government officers, social inclusion officers, we have to take the responsibility beyond every uh, uh, forthcoming generations uh, and must be conscious that we are the ones that have this uh, move happen. And why? Because when we have all these high technology systems available in our countries, and they are good for our countries because in the past people had to, to extend cables to make telecommunication. Now we can go by air. So we are in front of the most important changing opportunities for social inclusion in the history of the, our developing countries. Because this is the investment that will leverage all this accessibility, social inclusion uh, with real time will enable, for instance, I, I, I heard yesterday when, when comments saying that, well, I, I have to, to uh, uh, when I have a sign language interpretation uh, via mobile, there is a, a kind of, uh, how you say, a security or, or a, a privacy problem because it's someone intermediating your conversation. But when you talk about 5G and how it was mentioned here, it will have faster telecommunication with some system in a cloud that will make all this with artificial intelligence running and running and making it possible to, to have better uh, communication. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry if, if I exceeded the, the time, but I, I thought that I, I, I should try to sensibilize regulators and people who, who have the opportunity to make the things happen in our countries, to have the opportunity to uh, developers, for instance, to have the opportunity to understand the importance they have for the development of our country, talking about social inclusion and accessibility. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Pereira. Okay, so um, I see a couple of requests for the floor, and let's, we will only take two. Unfortunately, because of lunch, we have two requests for the floor, the young lady on the left-hand side here, and the young man on that side. Notice I stress young on both occasions. Yeah, so let's take the young lady first, please. Do we, no? All right, let's use this mic. I will try to be as concise as possible. I just wanted to comment a little bit about the proposal that came earlier from Mr. Coy. You spoke about deaf education. It clearly seems to me that the app that you are proposing for deaf education is basically a combination of two automated speech recognitions or two apps. The first thing that you're proposing is automated speech recognition technology to be used to translate a spoken language into text. And then you're also proposing that text be automatically translated into sign language. As a deaf person, and I will look to my colleagues seated in the front of the room as well, I just wanted to caution you that I work in a technical field, and even the best automated speech recognition today, the very, very best in the market, is not mature enough to provide accurate and quality translations or transcripts like you're mentioning. 
even from a spoken to a text language. So I just, I want to make sure you're not making assumptions and getting ahead of the game of what can actually be done. Real communication needs to be given to deaf and hard of hearing individuals, especially children at young tender ages in school. Sign language, on the other hand, and I believe my colleagues in the front of the room would agree with me, is a language in and of itself. It has its own grammar, it has its own syntax, punctuation, adjectives, facial expressions, body language, etc. Sign language is not just hands moving in the air. It incorporates much to become its own rich language. So when you're talking about an app supposedly being able to translate and replace an interpreter who takes years and years of training to become fluent, I think we're looking at a very potentially setting up that game poorly <laughs> and underserving those deaf children's learning abilities and their education. We want to make sure that they have a beneficial, meaningful educational experience. Um, I also find it fascinating because you mentioned deaf consumers not having been consulted in the process yet. So I would love to make sure that the deaf community here in Jamaica is involved in this process. And remember, whatever you're proposing, service for a specific community of people with individuals, keep functional equivalency in mind. Functional equivalency means it needs to be as good and as accurate as the information that the non-disabled people in the same setting are included. So please ask yourself, when you're launching an app like this, is it actually functionally equivalent? Uh, thank you for thank the, you, the comments. Thank you, Mr. Coy. Thank you. Um, I appreciate all, all that you've said. There are a couple of things that I need to um, uh, expand on. And, and I'll also respond to what you said at the end. So uh, I agree with you. Speech recognition technology does not provide 100% accuracy. However, um, we're about 97% of the way. And in addition, if we're looking at uh, domain-specific language, which it will be in a classroom setting, so there are particular words that you're going to be looking for, particular concepts that are going to be discussed, then the accuracy goes even higher, up toward 99.5%. So it is, it is possible within that, that limited domain of the classroom to have uh, accurate speech recognition. Now the step beyond that uh, of translating into a signing avatar, um, you mentioned that uh, deaf, uh, that sign language rather, is a language which is different from say English. Uh, and I agree with you. I did mention in the presentation that we, we understand the structure of the Jamaican Sign Language, and so we're actually going to be doing a translation from Jamaican Standard English into Jamaican Sign Language before using that to drive the avatar. There are examples of uh, working applications that actually do this, for instance, with uh, uh, Swiss German, um, Swiss German, and there's, there are also applications in America that actually do this relatively accurately. So it takes into account um, not just the structure and the syntax of uh, English, but it also takes into account the structure and syntax of, of sign language. And so there, there, are, there are working examples of this. Where it concerns uh, facial expressions, um, we're aware that sign language is more than just the moving of the hands. And there are actually projects and some relatively accurate working prototypes uh, that take into account this multimodal nature of sign language. So we're aware of the, the, the technical challenges and the domain-specific challenges. Uh, where it concerns, and we're incorporating that into our design. Where it concerns the uh, consultation with the deaf, I did mention that we are still in very, very early days, looking at the existing technical challenges and how we would approach those. So when we actually come to the design stage, we are certainly, before we attempt anything, going to be engaging um, the deaf community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, listen, because of time, we are taking only one more question. He's going to be extremely brief, and if you can respond extremely brief, it would help us. Uh, thank you very much. This is directed to <clears throat> my good lady from Suriname. I was wondering whether there are any regulatory difficulties in the rollout of your ICT 
programs and whether you have any difficulty in spreading it to the rural areas, considering that our countries have similar physical features. That's one. Uh, the second one is I do believe that uh, there is technology available digitally to ensure that we present accurate maps. There's a bit, a bit of a sensitive issue here, but I don't think the Suriname map is properly displayed, having indicated a large section of my country. All right, so that one is a bit sensitive. Um, I will just give our colleague from Suriname one minute to respond, and then we will leave to you. Um, thank you. Um, to respond when it comes to regulatory issues, yes, we have a lot of issues with that, and we are currently working on our legislation to enable us as a regulator to fully um, attend to all the needs, especially in the interior. Um, but we have good working relationships with both providers when it comes to spreading the network across all regions. So I think that is what hel is helping us, getting all people connected. Um, when it comes to your second point, I'm not going to go into that. It is the map that is officially used by our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I would advise you to get in contact with your ministry and you can discuss it on that level. Thank you. I think with that response, that is a good time for lunch. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please, if you can show your appreciation for the panelists. Very well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I want to now hand over to our MC at this point. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator Cleveland Thomas, as well as to our panelists. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. Remember what I said earlier this morning? We are working for an on-time departure today at 5 p.m. And so I'm going to kindly ask that we take a very short lunch, very short, 45 minutes, possible? Mm, yes. Okay. So silence means consent. And so lunch will be for 45 minutes. And so we're asking you kindly to reconvene at 1.45 so that we can go through one other session that focuses on regional developments. Thank you so much. We reconvene at 1.45. Well, 1.47. And, and Cleveland has reminded us that he'll come with his usual bell, so you'll hear him down at Choices, telling you it's time to come back.